Good afternoon. That was pretty good. <clears throat> I'm just delighted to introduce uh, today's presentation as part of the Dean's Innovative Leader Series. Today, we welcome MIT alumnus Ted Kelly, who serves as President, CEO, and Chairman of Liberty Mutual. We're fortunate to have Ted with us here today to share some of his thoughts on leadership, and he has really a very thoughtful perspective, and his firm has a very interesting history over the last few years, in particular, a great history of success. Before I say just a few more words about Ted, I'd like to do a small sales pitch and advertisement for the next speaker in this Dean's Innovative Leaders series. Next Friday, April 9th, Anatoly Chubais, General Director of Rusnano, will join us to discuss innovation strategies for economic development in Russia. Mr. Chubais has the ear of Prime Minister Vladimir Putin and is shaping policy in Russia across technology, innovation, and energy industries. He's also played an important role in the launch of the Skolkovo Moscow School of Management, where, as you know, MIT Sloan has an important founding sponsorship. So please, if your schedules permit, uh, come by next Friday uh, to hear some thoughts on this important region. Now, about today's presentation. Ted Kelly, President, Chair, and CEO of Liberty Mutual, has asked the question, responsibility, what's your policy? This isn't just an amazingly successful advertising campaign, although it is that. It's also the framework for Liberty Mutual's conservative and strategic business model, a model that has served this firm extremely well during this crisis. Under Ted's direction, Liberty Mutual has been a carrier on the move. In the last three years, Liberty Mutual has enlarged its independent agent-based business through the acquisition of Ohio Casualty and more recently Safeco. It's the fifth largest property and casualty insurer in the United States. The company also ranks 86th on the Fortune 500 list of largest corporations in the U.S. based on 2008 revenue. People close to Ted describe him as one of the most innovative and technologically aggressive CEOs in the industry. It's not really a big surprise to us. After all, he has a PhD in mathematics from MIT and, as a sidelight, has been an incredibly strong supporter of MIT across the institute uh, through these years. But Ted has led this industry in technological innovation for the agency market. Year over year, business strategy also decides where investment should be made in technology. Once the business decides what's needed, and defines what's needed and how that fits into the technology strategy, then the IT partners do the how of that innovation. This framework has allowed Liberty Mutual to be and remain a technological giant in this industry. Reflecting on its fiscal, su fiscal success, Standard & Poor's noted in a, re in a, a recent report that Liberty Mutual has a strong position in the U.S. market and appears poised to expand both its home and auto insurance lines. The S&P report also noted that it has not suffered the credit problems of other financial services firms. This isn't a coincidence. Ted attributes Liberty Mutual's success to conservative growth and smart acquisitions. As I mentioned, here at MIT, Ted has been involved in multiple ways, including the visiting committee for the math department, where he received his PhD, and also President Hockfield's uh, advisory council on regional engagement, which is so important to the continued development of business <clears throat> in the greater Boston and New England region. In addition to Liberty Mutual's broader role as one of the most philanthropic corporations in the Boston area, they've also been a major sponsor of research at MIT Sloan. We're all appreciative of what Ted and Liberty Mutual have done for and meant to MIT. Please, if we could, a warm MIT Sloan welcome for Ted Kelly. Thank you, Dean Slovenine. Uh, it's kind of um, interesting. This is my first formal presentation at MIT since my PhD thesis defense more years ago than I want to remember. So please be easier on me than I was. Um, I don't know if it's a compliment or a challenge in my manhood when Dean said that we have a conservative strategy. So I'll respond a little bit to that. But maybe what I'd like to do today is sort of describe how a company that 12 years ago 
was a relatively small uh, company uh, in the U.S. Uh, with a limited number of lines of business. Today is uh, not just the fifth largest in the U.S., but the sixth largest property and casualty company in the world, and will this year surpass AIG in terms of the U.S.-based international property and casualty insurer. And it's been a, an interesting path because it's uh, and, and unlike um, nascent industries, one does have to deal with inherently the old legacy databases. Uh, one has to change structure. Uh, one has to uh, sort of see where one wants to go much more clearly because you've got, uh, we have 46,000 employees back uh, 10, uh, 15 years ago, 1920, but where you want to go in terms of people. And I often think that the last person you should ask to talk about uh, strategy and leadership is, is a CEO because all great strategies are written in retrospect. You call it academia survivorship bias. People don't stand up here who are failures. So along the way, strategies, you, you, you're sort of, they're written after the fact. They're never as clear before you go into them. The second thing is uh, CEOs talking about leadership uh, and, you know, we're all highly delusional, and uh, we see the world in our own way. The, the last management book I read was about 25 years ago by a guy called Harold Janine who built ITT. And uh, his description of how he managed that company and this, the word you heard from the people who actually worked in the company were so apart uh, as if there were different universes. So everything I say, I take with a grain of salt. And... Uh, but I have with me Ted Gramer, who is a, a Sloan uh, MBA, and you can ask him privately afterwards where I was off track. Um, where, how do you change it? When I came into MIT, uh, when I came into Liberty in 1992, the company was, I was brought in because the company was essentially failing. It was an intuitive company, a known for seat of the pants, had not changed its business in many, many years. And I had the great support of a very far-sighted CEO who said he wanted me to help change the company. And a couple of things I sort of look back in my own career is that what works? What makes a successful organization? Well, number one, clearly given my background, was an or a fact-based analytical organization. I was coming to an organization that was essentially uh, intuitive. Very good, very intuitive, but fine. Second thing, all great sustained companies, mature industries, have great management teams. And I believe very strongly in great management teams. And the third thing is you have to value people. Uh, no matter how good we are, no matter how smart uh, the PhD and statisticians and technology people are, we are only successful as a company. If when somebody picks up the phone and says, Liberty Mutual, can I help you? One, they can, and two, they mean it. And the CAN is all about training technology, the meaning it is all about culture and value in people. So that when we talk about values, we believe in the import, huge importance of the individual to the success of the organization. I do think, and I'm not be political, that we have overemphasized in American business return on monetary capital and insufficient about the return on human capital. So the return on human capital is a key value that we espouse as equally with in terms of analytical and technological prowess. And in fact, uh, just two weeks ago, we paid out 190 million in non-management bonuses. Everybody in Liberty, from the bottom of the organization to the top, is eligible for performance bonus. And by the way, a $3,000 bonus to somebody making $45,000 a year is a lot more life-changing than a couple of million dollar bonus I might get. So that, those very so those are the things analytics and people technology. So one of the first like, tests of that was building the team. I've been there a couple of years, and two of my direct reports were fighting, the way typical corporate uh, infighting. Well, what happens in a corporation when you get infighting? Everybody below that organi uh, their organization fight. So one day I called in my office and I said, I don't care. The next time you fight, you're both fired. I don't care if it's right or wrong. They stopped and they became good. They actually ended up working very successfully together. So first of all, the signal was we are a team. We together, if we're going to conquer this thing, to save this feeling company, we have to work together. Second thing was how do you turn a company that traditionally has not been 
analytical into an analytical company. So we sat down with the head of human resource and education and we set about developing a management and a training program that said, for, just like in a, an education process, at what level of a person's career can we say for certain they've been exposed to this technical training and management training? And uh, we said that education has sort of two component parts. The technical is extremely important, but the culture is equally important. So we don't, each, the, when I first proposed the education, each SPU said, oh, hold it, uh, we'll do our own. And I said, no, we will have common education because we want a common culture. And uh, we developed, so as soon as the person is appointed a frontline supervisor. Now most of these people are people who have a low, relatively in the terms of low level jobs, they are flown into Boston for training. And I, if I'm in the office, meet with each course. I meet several thousand people a year. And if I'm not there, one of my direct reports. Because it is critically important that people who drive an organization don't just understand the technical side of management, because the technical side of management is the same whether it's in Microsoft, Boeing, or Liberty. It's the other side of management that really builds great companies. So, then the, then they, <coughs> so you get there and say, OK, now where do we go? We got the training going. And it was an interesting time when I took over CEO. Graham Leach Bliley was coming. And everybody said the banks are going to take over the world. So he said, did a little reflection on strategy and sort of looked at some numbers and a couple of things struck us. One, uh, clearly globalization was inexorable. And look over history, when you get big pools of capital, big pools would dominate and big markets dump, create big pools of capital. Second thing was that despite what everybody said, banks were not going to take over the world. And our reason was very simple. One, because they get uh, they're grossly undercapitalized, as we found out. Uh, banks' return on equity is ridiculously high, and on top of that, they get cheap money from the government so they can run great profits. Second, banks are not very well managed, as we've discovered. And third, there's one, if you, the history of American business points to one thing clearly. Com it's not scale that leads to mismanagement, it's complexity. Uh, and uh, if you look at uh, history of before your time, the LTV, Litton Industries, famous conglomerates of everybody's love affair in the 60s failed. ITT, under Janine, failed because of complexity. And we said, looked at banks, that they're going to fail. They don't like risk. They like high returns. And Citigroup, of course, failed. It, it spun off travelers because they didn't like the risk. And it failed not because of risk taking, because it was just too complex. There's nobody in the right mind could have managed the Citigroup. Citigroup. And then the other thing we said, cross-selling was everybody's belief, cross-selling. But we believe cross-selling is the abominable snowman of financial services. Lots of people claim to have seen it, but there's absolutely no analytical evidence that exists. So we decided those things. And we also said, we are, if you're going to succeed, if we're going to grow, we better be good at one thing. We had at that time a, an asset man, a good size asset management business, which we sold and decided to invest in, uh, in, um, in property and casualty worldwide. We were in one country back then. We are now in 20 countries. We insure one in every three cars in Venezuela. Very interesting place. Very good place to do business, believe it or not. Uh, we are the only U.S. company with a, an office in Beijing, U.S. PNC company with an office in Beijing. So how did we get there? I mean, what, what was the analytical process? We then decided we needed to begin to look at our core businesses. Historically, uh, it is a highly people-intensive business. So I just said it right day one. The IT department would report. I have 14 people reporting to me, which is large for job. But the IT would report directly to the CEO. That's very unusual in our industry. Why? Because success at IT, we don't create anything. We, we, we're, we're, we're theory, we push data. So if I couldn't get involved and understand deeply what the possibilities of IT are, so on a regular basis, I meet with the head of IT, who's actually working with um, people at MIT to help us develop more useful mobile technologies. If I don't understand and sit there and talk, where is, where is IT going? What can we do? If all IT is about is helping us execute the strategy, we will fail. For us, IT has to inform the strategy, which sets us very much apart from other people in our industry. It isn't 
what is, what, how does IT make what you're doing now better? It is, how does IT make our business model better? Very different thought process. So it's not just in terms of uh, the analytics, which is a given nowadays, but it's also the question, a key question for us is how will your generation buy? How will you use, by the way, people who buy online are lousy customers. They have no loyalty. So how can we create an online experience, both in terms of in technology and in terms of the experience, that will build loyalty? Tough question. Quite, how do you answer that? Well, clearly the technology side and getting good you know, site developers, that's a given. But what do we know of an individual marketing preferences? How well do we analytically understand the consumer at the micro level, which we were just talking about, that we can shape that experience, that the person who buys one of our policies appreciates to get in something else? Now, with that in mind, now go to our advertising campaign. What is the relationship between that and our advertising campaign? If, when a person comes to buy any product in front of a, a if you, you want them to be a price-only buyer, then you have to the lowest price. And that's not a very good business model, commoditization. What we want to do is create in people's minds a high idea of what liberty is. So we started way back, when we started to internationalize, we said, OK, how do we create a liberty? And we have an, in, in our, in our, in our uh, front lobby a uh, uh, company creed that was written in the 40s that says, we help people live safe and more secure lives. It is a mantra. It informs what we do. But it isn't a very operational thing. So we studied thing, came up with three values. One was integrity. And I rejected that one. Because what company says we don't have integrity? I'm, I'm, no, but they convinced me that people believe in integrity. Second was treat people with dignity and respect because our model is dignity, treating people well. And third was high quality products at a reasonable price. Not the highest quality and not the lowest price. And we set about the goal of every office you go into, whether it be Bangkok, Boston, Buenos Aires, you will recognize <coughs> that. So we turned all, all our education translated into Chinese, Vietnamese, Portuguese, Spanish. So everybody is oriented towards creating a company culture that helps underlie our product. So when we were looking for a new advertising campaign, when, when the advertising company interviewed some three or 400 employees, they said, what is it about liberty? To do the right thing. Now, we built a responsibility campaign. What has that got to do with online buying? What we want to do is when the person sits down, to the extent we know their preferences in some sense, from an analytical, we can tie that to the idea of you're going to do business with a responsible company. So we're willing to invest three or four years in an advertising campaign that does not pick up the phone and call us. It is creating an image will ultimately tie into the analytic market <coughs> analytics. So that with that thing, it's very easy. You start your process, you educate your people, and you move forward. But some things go wrong along the way. Uh, Paul Sagan talked about 9-11 uh, being seminal. Pragamai, it was for us too. I was going to the uh, office, a board meeting actually, and they heard about the building being flown into, and it was in a Cessna or something. And then I heard later another one. Next year's a board meeting. I said, I can't go in here, not knowing what we've lost. So I said to my staff, uh, gee, what's the loss estimate? And they said, no idea. I said, give me a number. So they came up with a number, a billion and a half dollars. Turned out we were right within 100 million. <coughs> totally different. So I said to the board, we're going to lose a billion and a half dollars. Now, had I not been able to say that, and I had the data to say it, the board would have lost <coughs> confidence. Excuse me. So right there, at a moment of crisis, the ability to have reasonable data 
and the confidence to say it, even though I knew it was probably wrong. <laughs> I mean, it was right in aggregate. Then I had a meeting with management, management training group, and I said, this is what we do. This is what we do. So we got through it. We reported out a loss that year for a billion seven, <coughs> a billion seven a reasonable loss. And in early February, I got a call from my uh, CFO and chief counsel. Now, the last thing you want to have is both together. Usually it means somebody's going to jail, <laughs> but um, it wasn't that. They said, uh, Ted, do you realize how bad <coughs> the asbestos situation is? And I said, how bad is it? And they said, well, we've got one case where they want $5 billion. And we had $6 billion in capital. So uh, I said, gee, this is not very good. So I said, what do we go about? I said, well, we can fight it. The facts are on our side, but juries are juries. But there is another time where having the organization that could look into the abyss and have the data to understand the abyss. So that, the analytics support the threat, or response to the threat. So we had that happen to us six years earlier, we couldn't have coped with it. So a billion and a half law, a billion seven loss, and then a threat of a five billion dollar <coughs> loss. At the same time, I went to the next room and said to people, we're going to buy, <coughs> buy a company. So compartmentalization <laughs> is uh, <laughs> a key factor. So all those things came together different times to help us create what was then a $6 billion company, and is today a $31 billion company. A company that is built on responsibility, analytics, and people. So, thank you. <clears throat> Questions? Yeah. yeah, you make it sound easy. What was your biggest problem getting it happen? It's sort of, it's, uh, 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 that's a good, very, very good question. Um, maybe go way back to the very start. When I first got there as a new, new organization, and some of you will do that, when you go to a new organization, the first thing you notice is what they're bad at, not what they're good at. Because in every organization, institution is good at some things and almost do them instinctively. And uh, when I was first there, I, uh, you know, after about a week, I was going to fire everybody. And the one thing about firing people, eventually it's very lonely. The building gets empty. <laughs> and uh, I, it wasn't, and I, and I was struggling to do something. As well. I was happy to be living downtown. I was walking over to work one morning, and there was something I wanted done that I said, I'm going to have to do it myself. I haven't done it for 10 years, but I'm going to do it. And at one more meeting, and a young lady said, I think I know what you want done. And she went off and did it. She was an MBA from one of those lists, Wharton, or one of those places, you know. But anyway, she came back with a response. It wasn't quite what I had wanted, but it was good. And I realized it, it hadn't, Liberty hadn't gotten to where it was by being a bad company. My job as leader of the company was to find what is good and build that, not to eliminate what is bad. So the positive attitude, getting that instilled in the organization. And it probably took, realistically, it wasn't until 9-11, when the company was really under stress, that the company came together as a unit. It probably took all of nine years, getting the culture changed around a positive analytical oriented thing. And there's no, there's no contradiction between analytical orientation and people orientation. So that was the hardest thing, to get that culture strong. And you know, because I, I, I can be pretty demanding on people. And, Understand that demanding as you may be, people are fundamental. See, fundamentally, there's not the other thing is, and maybe maybe it sounds like a silly thing to say. Always remember what Napoleon said: there are no bad soldiers; there are only bad officers. And our belief is that uh, we we employ what as I said, forty-six thousand people, ninety-six, ninety-seven percent of the people who come into the building every day want to go home feeling they've done a good job. Our job is to tell them what a good job is. To get a management team who can do that consistently on all levels is the hardest thing in a large organization. And that took years. 
9-11 helped get there. Yeah. Okay. Um, you mentioned that the hardest thing to manage is not size, but complexity. Mm -hmm. And Liberty Mutual has expanded into many countries internationally, and I would think that that comes with a lot of complexity on its own. Um, can you talk about how those units are organized and what are your th what were your criteria or decision criteria on how to organize it either geographically or by product? And that, 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 that actually is a, is a really fundamental question uh, and we struggle with it. Uh, we believe, uh, I believe, and boast some experience in accountability. I don't like matrix organizations. Uh, the, uh, the problem with the matrix organization is they give everybody an excuse for failure. One of the key things a manager or has to do, an executive, is to remove excuses for failure. So too many interdependencies create fail failure. So we, we organized ourselves. When I first uh, got in, took over his job, I said, I can't run California out of Boston. So when we got to go international, I said, there's no way I can run Venezuela or Brazil out of Boston. We can't run California. So we organized internationally very differently from almost any, any other company. We do not have country managers. We have country leaders, fundamentally different. So the guy who's running uh, Vietnam or the woman who's running Argentina, if they're, they're they, we call them country presidents. Their next job isn't running a bigger country. They're, if they do well, their next job is running a bigger part of the business. So we, we don't use international as just a way to train Americans to sort of pretend they're, you know, they're useful internationally. We use, lo as much as we can, we use uh, local people, if there is a talent, to run countries for us. So we are organized very much on a country-by-country -country basis. With a no we hold them accountable for growth, hold them accountable for profitability. We give them all the support and resources they need, but it's their job. It is not a matrix. They can't say, well, the guy in Spain didn't ship me something, or the guy in Boston. No, it's your job. You run Vietnam, you grow Vietnam. So we're very much uh, organized along that way. So people get a lot of accountability very, very quickly. In fact, we have a CDP program uh, where we hire um, a lot of Sloan, people from Sloan School. And one of the guys now running um, uh, Thailand, is in fact, he's a, a Chinese guy out of well, that program who's now running Thailand. He's responsible for Thailand. No one else is responsible. Now, he's got support, but it's his job. And whatever lines of business he wants to write there, as long as they're consistent with their business model, he can write them. Yeah. Given that your company is so focused on analytics, how do you measure the impact of this advertising campaign? <coughs> well, that's, that's a very, the, the, thing, the thing that bothers me, I'll, I'll answer sort of circuitously, the thing that bothers me about the advertising campaign is uh, we like it. And that's scary. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, one, one, one of the things, that, uh, you know, part in, in any job is you have to be absolutely confident and racked by anxiety at the same time. So I'm confident it's a good campaign, but I worry it's not. And what we try to measure uh, is top of mind recognition and whatnot. The, the kind of interesting thing that's happened in the campaign, our top of mind recognition, name recognition, is just growing dramatically well. However, people don't know what we do. <laughs> they think we sell mutual funds. They think we sell health products or something. No, no. So it's, it's moderately successful. In fact, we're, but the fact that in, in, in say, auto and home, uh, we, apart from Geico, uh, we're the second fastest growing company. Advertising must be something to do with it. It's, it's you know, it's, the old joke about advertising is 50 cents and every dollar's wasted. You just don't know which 50 cents. But we, I mean, again, we purposefully chose, think about advertising. There's three voices in advertising. There's uh, adult to adult, adult to child, child to child. And I work back. Child to child. Geico. Love the ads. But it's child to child. It's, you know, uh, what I would call in England, lad advertising. <laughs> um, uh, adult to child, that's the old Allstate. You're in good hands. We're going to take care of you. What we try to create is an adult to adult conversation. And that is much harder to measure the impact than the, uh, either of the other two. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a question I ask constantly. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, but at some stage, if it's not working, we'll, much as I love it, we'll kill it. You know, I mean, if you're going to be analytic, you've got to live by the numbers, even though you may not like it. 
uh, is your CIO a business partner, a technologist? What are his key he's a, he's a, he's a He's a technologist. He came to us from AT&T. Uh, but he sits, see, we, he sits in, in every business session. He sits, and, I, and as I say, I meet with him and dream technology once every month. Uh, we, I, don't have a, I don't have any executive committee. I don't believe in that. What we have is we have a Monday lunch bunch. <laughs> uh, we get together for lunch every second Monday, uh, the 14 of us, 15 of us going to meet. The first hour is just talking, just bullshitting, whatever, football, politics, anything that happens to be. Then the next hour is discussing business issues and specific issues. There are no, there are no votes, but the technologist is supposed to participate as equally. And if the issue is business, he participates on the business side. If the issue is technology, the business people get involved in technology. So we want as best we can to make sure while we're together as a group, your specific role is less important than your role as member of management. Of course, when you leave the room, you have your specific role. So he, he'd regard himself as a technologist, but a significant uh, in, involvement with the businesses. So it was very much in, in, integral. And uh, it's, it's, he's, it's, we spent a lot of time on that. It's hugely important. Yeah. Oh, I'm curious about your characterization of the company in the past as being not very analytical. I mean, it's an insurance company and you crunch data. I just, I, it doesn't make sense. What was happening? How could it not have been analytical? Uh, well, it's sort of, the wonderful thing about regulation, it kills free enterprise. It was a regulated, totally regulated industry, including pricing. And if, you don't, if your price is set by some politician, you don't need to be very analytical. And the price was set politically for the product uh, until the early 80s. So it, had a, it never needed a culture of analysis. All it needed was a, you know, sort of, it was, think about distributing electricity on their managed utility, all you need is enough outlets in the wall. You don't need to know an awful lot about the economics because all you do is pass your rate increase through to the government and they'll prove it or not approve it. I mean, I'm not overstating the case at all. Regulation killed analytics. And that is, you know, and so when, we, when the industry became deregulated, the shortfall uh, was just very, very obvious. Chief Risk Officer said, and how do you evaluate how well he has done? I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't believe in the Chief Risk Officer. We are, uh, for two reasons. One, we are in the business of risk. It has to be interwoven fundamentally into what we do. And uh, so uh, we have a very rigorous and disciplined risk management program. And I might be explaining how, 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 how it sort of helps the business. And in fact, at the board level, I have told the board uh, that I don't want a risk committee. Now, I, I'm going to retire in a few years, so there's going to be one just transitional. But the, even at the board level, I don't want any director, and we have a very, very good board. No director ought to say, risk is not my responsibility. I tell them everybody's responsibility is risk. Now, the risk, we do have a very disciplined ERM process built on analysis, and we look at the, by the way, our worst risk is, believe it or not, credit. <laughs> we are a huge exposure to credit and understanding that. We look at our capital. Each business is responsible for its capital management, and then we put it all together on a quarterly basis and see where exposures are. And I actually worked, we were talking with Dean uh, earlier, in 2007, June, uh, and sort of back door into risk management, I was playing golf. And I was talking with the cat. I said, do you do this often? He said, no, I'm a mortgage broker. And I said, what? And I went back, and I, uh, that next day I called the chief investment officer and I said, what's going on? This guy's a mortgage broker and he's a caddy in. And he says, we're really worried about the credit crisis. And he said, we're going to come and talk to you about it. And we went through, put it through the ERM process and realized, given the exposure of our capital and businesses, it said, we can't afford the risk. So we actually hedged, totally hedged out of the market it wasn't my, wasn't my comment. He was already doing it, but it was just the this conversation was triggered. We totally hedged out of the market in November of uh, 2007. We wouldn't have done that 
if we didn't have a rigorous ERM process. But I, ca I can't visualize an insurance company where risk is not fundamentally the responsibility of each, um, each business manager. Now, we, we look at a very different thing. I, I, I'm in a bank board. And one of the things that struck me very forcibly, the uh, difference between banks and insurance companies, the banks are now changing. In June, when we start the planning process, the first question we ask is, what can put us out of business? And by the way, our nightmare is a Northeast hurricane. It would cost the industry 80, 90 billion dollars. Cost us six or seven billion before reinsurance. So the first thing we say, if there is a Northeast hurricane, how do we know it will be open for business the next day? I mean, that's fundamental in the starting process. Banks, on the other hand, approach it, how much extra risk can I take to make a profit? Very different thought. We, we actually look at, we look at ruination as a fundamental business tool, not as a, some, not, not as just a long, not as a bump of the tail, a statistical tail. So we, I insist that the ERM be part of everybody's business uh, management. Yeah? Uh, when you hire MBAs, uh, which is more important? Specific skills or more generic thinking and interpersonal skills? Both. <laughs> so, you know, it's, that's, no, that's a good question. I, I don't believe in general. In the end, um, everybody has to have an intellectual calling card. And I mean that. It, it, the wonderful thing about business problems are there is no unique approach to solving a business problem. Different backgrounds, especially as you get above the pure technical, different backgrounds lead to different perspectives. And it is those different perspectives that really make it exciting answers. So I want to have somebody who has clearly demonstrated a strong technical capability in something. So they've proven, proven their, chop, or their chops, but equally well have the common sense to see it in the larger, larger score. And I've, cause it, if, you know, the ideal thing is you, you throw somebody a billiard ball and tell them to unravel it. You know, that's, that's a, a lot of business problems look like that. How you get the toehold of the business ball depends on, on what your skill is. But you have to see the whole ball, not just the skill. So I think both are critically important. The second thing, and probably more important than those two, is uh, what I would call cultural fit. And cultural fit's dangerous because the danger of that is we end up looking alike. And I don't, so we try to provide that. But cultural fit in the terms that they will both benefit and add to the culture. The people who fail and liberally almost always fail, uh, not technically, with the MBA types, but because they don't fit culturally. And what does culture mean? You hire an MBA, we, put them in a, we pay them very well, put them in fast track, and they really do move quickly if they're good. But they're going to be sitting beside someone who's paid half what they're paid and not going to move as quickly. If the person sitting alongside them doesn't appreciate what they do, or doesn't appreciate how they act, they aren't going to succeed. The people who really succeed and, uh, are the people who are really, really good, but the people who don't need to be told they're really good. <laughs> so, but it's, it's both. But the technical skills critically. You can't, generalists, I think one of the, just looking at another company, one of the things, first things uh, Jeff Imelt did when he took over GE was get rid of the general manager thing. He says, I want people who are good at stuff. You know, it's a different, nowadays it's really important to be good at something. Really, really good. Yeah, um, going back to the topic of analytics, I'm curious to hear uh, whether at any time you have relied on your pure guttural instincts over raw numbers, and if so, how do you strike that balance between numbers and analytics versus instincts towards making a decision? Well, uh, I'll give you uh, sort of two examples. If it's all analytics, a computer could run to do the job. I mean, it's, it's not all analytics, the, the combination of into intuition always comes into the end. Strata, and it is, see, there, there's sort of two, there two levels. The, the numbers will show one thing. Then your experience is, numbers show something, but can you line the organization behind the answer? I mean, there are approaches to the business that are extraordinarily successful that we couldn't do. We just wouldn't, couldn't align the organization behind them. So you just reject those. It's, it, are they achievable? The second thing is some common sense. I'll give you two analytic experiences. Uh, both uh, back in uh, the dot-com era, we had an outside consultant who kept coming to me and said, you know, you're going to be killed by dot-com. And uh, they kept saying, I said, okay, come and convince me. So they invited in about 12 people from all over the world. 
I didn't have any of my staff join, just myself in, in a conference room. And over, a, made a, a very deeply analytic presentation over an hour and a half, and they said, and so you see, there are now 17 companies attacking you from dot-com space. And I said, I'm glad there's 17. If there's one, I'd be worried. Think about it. The analytics, they, they wiped each other out. didn't wipe me out. So the analytics showed there were 17. The common sense showed it didn't have to worry. The other one was uh, we were about to go into We had a very, very successful business in uh, the very successful business in Latin America. We, weren't, we didn't like Europe as a developed industry. Southern Europe was attractive. So we got a chance to go into Spain. And another consultant came in and said, we understand you're going to Spain. You cannot, you cannot launch a successful auto business in Spain. But I, and they showed the numbers why. And I, and I, and I never did tell the head of international he couldn't do it. Because he didn't, he didn't know that he thought I, that anybody would think he'd fail. But I said, my intuition said, yeah, they're right, except one thing. What's the first person, what's the first thing a person does as soon as they feel the middle class? Buy a car. Buy a car. And I said, as Spain gets more wealthy, people are going to buy cars. So the an analysis of how business have been working in the past didn't give the insight into the fundamental thing, why people buy insurance for cars. So we've now got a huge and successful business in Spain. So it's analytics and form, they don't make the decisions. Common sense and judgment is a huge part of it. So. You mentioned uh, earlier um, the importance for a manager to appreciate an uh, employee and make mm -hmm. them feel valued. Uh, I'm just wondering, how do you, how do you change culture into a more appreciative culture? Well, what we do is we hold it, uh, there's a whole, a whole lot of aspects to do. Uh, one, uh, early on, and I hate to keep talking about firing, we let go a lot of very successful managers who didn't treat the people well, just didn't treat the people well. Second thing is, we never use the term diversity. We use the term inclusion. Fundamentally different. When people, when you come in, I don't care what your race, color, creed, ethnic, background, sexual orientation. When you become part of liberty, you are part of the family. You are a valued part of the family. And anybody who doesn't treat you as a valued part of the family will be let go. So there is, we, do, we don't have any, despite their size, we don't have any subgroups of because they all, we work hard to make everybody part of a really important family. The other thing is we back it up. I'll give you an example of indications. We, uh, Argentina had uh, currency devaluation in the early part of the decade. And our, our workers, we couldn't do anything about it for the first couple of years. Our workers, effectively, uh, their standard of living was reduced by 65 to 70 percent. So they went from living a good middle class life to the age of poverty. Finally, after three years, we made a profit. And we just took all that money and gave them bonuses. Think of that signal to the, them. It was, you know, now maybe being, not being a public company, we could do that more easily. But we took all our first profits and gave it back to our employees. Because despite their hardship, they had worked to hold that company together. They earned that money much more than the capital had earned the money. So the people who created the wealth got the wealth. Now, where we're a public company, that might have been more difficult. But we believe fundamentally, and over and over again, we emphasize, and both through managerial actions and whatnot. The other thing we don't stand, we try to avoid having what I would call imperial managers. The most dangerous manager or executive who is one who loves the position more than the job. And a good test of a successful executive is, do they love the job more than the position? If they don't, they're, they're going to destroy the organization. So we, we, we work a lot on it. So, yeah. I studied mathematics in college and totally loved it. So I'm interested in how your background as a mathematician influences your managerial and decision-making styles. There's sort of, sort, of, sort of a whole lot of answers to that. Uh, one, obviously, you know, I can facility with numbers is, is part of it. but. Probably, maybe haven't done research in mathematics, unlike experimental sciences. When you start a mathematical research, 
you run the real possibility of spending years and getting nothing. If you're an experimental scientist, you always, a negative experiment at least can get you a PhD thesis. <laughs> <laughs> a positive experiment will get you a good job. Uh, but, and so you have to have that, you have to have the, I had to develop somewhere along the way the confidence that I could take that leap of faith. And then, uh, as an executive building the organization that you're able to take the leap of faith knowing the organization will build you right or you're wrong. No, no, it's sort of a land in there. So that analytical approach. The other thing it is, I think, the discipline of having to think through tough things. You know, I was, I was thinking about uh, communication, uh, actually, uh, on some lesson, about writing. You know, the old uh, Cicero thing, if you can't write it, you don't understand it. And think about mathematics. Uh, you, when you, do, you could intuitively see the answer, but you had to sit and hammer out the proof. That discipline is extremely important in business. You may see where you want to go, but you have to be able to hammer out how to get there. And I think that, 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 that little thing, that, that sort of difference between back to the intuition and numbers, being able to have the intuition, but knowing you can actually build the steps to it. That mathematics helped in that. So. Somebody else. Hi, uh, do you think innovation could play a key role in um, helping to build competitive advantage, reducing cycle times, retaining customers, et cetera? And oh. if yes, what has Liberty Mutual specifically done to build a culture of innovation? Ah, that's a great question. In fact, we were talking about that. Innovation is, even though we're a mature industry, innovation is constant. There are no sustainable competitive advantages. There are none. There are sustainable competitive cultures. Because fast as, I mean, we're a mature industry and there's, there are, there are, we can't patent things. So if we, are copyright things. So if we do something, people follow us very quickly. So both, uh, t take for example, simple things like, how, as, as talking about the website. We can innovate the website experience. Now, p if it works, people will copy us immediately. But what we have to do is then create a culture that aligns behind that innovation. And uh, Ted w runs their claim organization. You, innovation in using analytics to predict the appropriate settlement, not to determine, but predict what is an appropriate settlement value, that would give us a huge leg up. Uh, innovation in understanding consumer buying habits. Uh, one of our most successful, we're, we're by far the biggest affinity marketer of uh, personalized products in the country, by far. So innovation is a constant thing, but innovation without, a, without being able to line the people up behind the innovation is, is, is with, so innovation for innovation's sake. It has to be innovation the organization can execute. But companies, unless we do that. See, another sort of thought process has always been stasis is not an acceptable economic condition. You either grow or die. Second thing is being caught in the deadly middle. Too, too small to be big and too big to be small is not a tenable position. So you've got to decide what you're going to do. If you're going to be niche and succeed, then you can have a very tightly creative, innovative culture and move nimbly. If you're going to be large, you've got to choose your points of innovation and line behind them. We chose to be large. Innovation is critical of what we do, but executing behind the innovation is equally important. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's working. Um, how has um, your vision as a leader um, and the challenges that you think you will face ahead uh, change as a consequence of the recent financial crisis? That's, uh, I don't, th I, I, talk back to, I talked earlier about risk management. I don't think it has changed our thoughts about risk management at all. Uh, because I think we as an industry, and I, not just we, Liberty, but we as an industry have done a remarkably good job in that, in that area. My, cons my deep, deep, deep concern and it's sort of, I, I alluded to it, is we are seeing, in response to the crisis, the political response will, in fact, curtail innovation and growth. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, I'm, trying, I'm trying not to be political, but think about right now, as of yesterday, the, the most important parts of consumer credit Mortgage is 95% or 90% controlled by the government, and student loans are now nationalized. A culture where increasing parts of the financial market are nationalized will ultimately not grow. 
And we are, so the, the danger of overregulation is something that really is concern. And there's a total lack of understanding of the risk. Capital has nothing to do with solvency. Liquidity is, has to do with solvency. Capital is a, uh, a way of controlling growth. They're getting it all wrong. They're talking about size, is, you know, size being systemic. Size has nothing to do with systemic risk. It's complexity and, in, and interrelationships. So the whole, what worries us most is the world um, is going to be less conducive to companies taking appropriate risk. And the, by the way, appropriate is a really important word, appropriate risk and innovation. So that, that, that is a concern we have. So I spend much, much more time in Washington and you know, with regulators than I ever dreamed I should. So uh, I, it, it's, a, it's, it's a worrisome thing. Doesn't, the, the crisis doesn't change our management approach. It could change the concern about the future. I think uh, that's about time. You guys, thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Everybody. Uh, you know this school is all about principled, innovative leaders. Uh, you can't ask for a better example than Ted Kelly. Okay, we can thank Ted one more time. Thank you.